Right. Good evening. We'd like to welcome everybody to our fourth episode of our Beyond the Lodge Hideaway series. This evening, we're going to be talking about Elephant's Eye, based in Wangi National Park, on the border of Wangi National Park, um, an eco-luxury lodge that we, we're very lucky to be to be part of. And this evening, we have a very exciting guest, and it's much anticipation has been built for this live as we had to postpone it last week. So we're very excited to have you with us, John Matham from Cape Talk. Thank you for joining us this evening. Pleasure, Kim. And it's ESCOM's fault that we had to postpone last week, not mine. Yes, I know. I know. We have very little control over that. And of course, we have Garth here, Garth Jenman, our director. Welcome, Garth. Hi, folks. <laughs> Welcome, John. Great having you Thank on. Thank you, Garth. I haven't had the courage to go to a hairdresser yet. I think <laughs> <I have. laughs> it is. It, you do need a little bit of courage to walk in there after lockdown with yeah. for, for a new haircut. Um, so, John, you went to Elephant's Eye. You went to Zimbabwe actually for the first time ever in 1970. Um, and I'm going to ask you to talk into that a little bit. Before I do that, I would like to say, everybody who's watching, please can you give us a hello in the comments, tell us where you're watching from, and of course, leave any questions as we go along in the live for either Garth or John. John is has worn many hats in his career. He has been an actor, a writer, broadcaster, a game ranger, and now he is a radio talk show host for Cape Talk. So very interesting to hear all your stories. But let's start with Zimbabwe in the 1970s. John, what was it like back then? Uh, it was wild, fantastically yeah. so, in, in the best possible way. Um, you know, Wangi at that time, if you ask people about game reserves that needed to be visited, there were four. There was Kruger, Wangi, um, the Masai Mara, and Serengeti. Wangi mm -hmm. was up. Um, it it was basic. Uh, it still is, or it mm. was last time I visited. But it's big. It's um, exciting. Elephants have always been a huge feature of mm. it. It's always had a very, and in, in the 70s, it had a very, very good predator population. And th there was a, there's always been a kind of greater freedom in the Zimbabwean parks, I think. You know, you what you can do... Um, in, in terms of going in and, I don't know, being less observed and less regulated. Whether that's a good yeah. or a bad thing is debatable, but it's it's always been there. And, you know, you could camp, and we camped in the middle of nowhere, and in the way that one can of still, I suppose, in parts of Botswana, but there was a rugged wildness and a grandeur about it yeah. in the 70s. And the populations of... <sighs> Everywhere, there are always rises and, and crashes in populations of, of animals. But I probably went once every 18 months for about five years. And to Wangi National Park? Yeah. Oh, wow. And Did you drive down? Drive down. Drive up. I, mean, <laughs> I have to remember where we are. I'm yes. normally there, so it's... Yeah. it's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, it was driving up. I, mean, I was living in, I was uh, living between the Eastern Cape and Johannesburg, so it, it was, it wasn't that much of a drive. And mm. getting through the border was a lot easier then than it is now. So it wasn't that, that long a trip. And we were young and foolish and fueled by alcohol. So uh, to drive yeah. straight through and be at the gates as they opened in the morning was, you know, leave Joe. So you have quite a um, a past with Wangi National Park. I had the idea that you'd only been there twice, but you, so you know it quite well, and you from the nineteen seventies. Yeah, I, yeah, and and I was when I arrived in uh, to at Elephant's Eye, I just spent um, I just spent nine nights at three different wilderness safaris camps in Botswana, their top of the range camps, mm. and. So I was kind of going, oh, I'm going to Zimbabwe and Wangi. <laughs> oh. And then we had one of those incredibly epic Zimbabwean storms on the way down from, oh, from Vic Falls on the way down to the lodge. Yeah. And But before that, uh, chatting to my driver and looking at these game fences on the right as we were driving down and saying, who owns that? And he'd mention a cabinet minister. And then 10 k's oh. later, who 
appear a cabinet minister and that was depressing mm. and then came this incredible storm and that excited me yeah. and we got we got to elephant's eye quite late at night and and then i woke up the next morning and there were elephants drinking from the dam the water hole the dam in in front of where i'd spent the night and you know, i'm not in the park and here they mm. are and mm. we couldn't we couldn't swim in the swimming pool because the elephants were i don't know whether you fixed that problem but the elephants <laughs> were in the swimming pool dry at that time it's so such a wonderful there. problem to have yeah mm. We, no, we, we, John, we haven't fixed that problem. We, we just try and pump more water for them so that they leave our pool alone. Yeah. Well, I think just to talk about those pumps quickly, Garth, I don't know whether in 2013, if there were those pumps around the, the concession, um, Ele Elephant's Eye being on a private concession, is that something that has changed since 2013 or was that already there? No, we, we, we obviously inherited some old boreholes and then we, um, we, over the years, we've added to them. And we also went through a, a, a really bad drought where we lost a few boreholes as well, where they'd actually literally dry up. Um, but we have, we have dropped a few extra ones uh, on the other side of our concession. We've put in a really nice solar one that we pumped to the, you know, that's where we've got the, um, the sleep out deck. Um, so, yeah, we've, we've developed the, the concession quite a bit. And, and one of the main things, obviously, for wildlife is, is water. And that's, I think that's the important thing about having um, a human presence or a tourism presence in, in a space like that, um, to be able to provide those kind of conservation initiatives. Now, John, while we're talking, I'm actually just going to um, share a little video. Just give me a moment to find it. Um, to well, what show it looks like now. Of what it looks like now since, you, wow. since you've been, and then maybe you can tell us Maybe you can tell us if, if it's very different. Let me just yeah. get it. See what see anything that you see has changed. Um see. Sorry, this is my this is my first rodeo hearing the screen. We look deep into your computer there. <laughs> I should have. Fed your whiskey okay. to the computer, not to yourself. <laughs> <laughs> right. Are you seeing it? I'm hearing it, and I'm sure I'll see it. Well, there's water in the pool. Yes. Hasn't all been drunk by the elephants. <laughs> so beautiful. It 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 looks very similar. I mean, it um, it looks a lot greener, grass and trees. But that's that was probably. I think there was quite a significant drought at the time that I was up there. Yeah, but and that's why the elephants would have been at know, the pool as well. Otherwise, it looks exactly. Well, you know, a little tarted up. You spent a bit of money, Garth, have managed to squeeze a few, <laughs> few <laughs> rands out of you to tart it up. But it's, it's, I mean, it's exactly that, that you're outside of park. Uh, how far is it? It took about a half an hour to drive into into the park. So how far is it? Yeah, so that's so so it is about half an hour. Well, it was actually. And, and since your time there, we've um, actually put a new gate in directly from our concession directly into the park. Okay. Um, so we drive off our concession and directly in, you know. Mm. So, I mean, that's the amazing part about Wangi, you know, is that we've got this forestry area that, um, that borders the, around the park and it acts as an amazing buffer area that protects the park. But of course, there's no fences between um, the forestry area and the national park. So the wildlife moves uh, comfortably between uh, both areas. 
I mean, all, all of the animals that we saw there, I saw during my, how long was I there? 48, 60 hours or something like that. Um, so, herd lion, uh, on the second night, herd lion, and then saw very fresh spur, very close to the lodge the next morning, saw hyena coming to drink at, at the water hole. So, I mean, just, just sitting on the balcony of my um, accommodation, I could have picked up a very, very good mammal and bird list without moving. Mm. And that's the amazing thing about it is you, you get that experience right there. And it's nice to spend time at the lodge as well. And inst instead of having to leave it, you know, it's such a beautiful lodge to spend time. And I remember the last time I went there, actually, there had been a lion kill, I think by chalet number eight, which is the last chalet. Yeah. And we got there and they said to us, they were like, so maybe just be a little bit aware because there, there was a, a, a lion kill of a buffalo just by chalet number eight. And I think I was in number six or something. And I was like, this is, <laughs> this is very exciting, but I'm kind of nervous to go to my room now, you know? So, so it is, you've got the untamed nature of Wangi right in, right in the lodge, um, you know, right around the lodge, um, which is amazing. I, I went for a walk as well with um, a wonderfully knowledgeable man. And again, that's, that is so, it's such a good way of experiencing the other side of the bush because when you're in a, an open vehicle you're, you're kind of and particularly if you're a first or second or you're early in your safari career you really mm. are chasing the big charismatic mammals and the predators but when you're out walking you accept that you're probably not going to see them you might get lucky but mm. you're going to see nine of them and you're going to understand better the way mm. that the environment works and how it all knits together and, mm. um, and, and that, that that to me is an incredibly important when when i was guiding i was a terrible guide but i used to really love taking people out of the walk because it was, yeah. it's such an intimate experience yes was i was just you know. just put the words right out of my mouth mm. um so we have actually a question so a question. Would you read it? I can't. I can't see the question. No, I'm. I'm, go, I'm going to read it to you. Um, so on Cape Talk, you you often speak about supporting local, um, supporting local business, especially now. I think as as the world seems to have gotten a little bit smaller after lockdown, and our accessibility to the world. Um, is this an experience for South Africans as well to get to Elephant's Eye to to go to Wang? Absolutely. Mm. I mean, you, 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 the, the, the politics of Zimbabwe is, is deeply problematic and has mm. been for a, for a very long time. But I, you know, I've been visiting various parts of it since for, for 50 years. And I've had a couple of unpleasant, halfway unpleasant encounters with law enforcement officials. Um, but the experience of being a tourist in Zimbabwe, whether you're in Chinazua, no matter where you are, mm. is, is an extraordinary one. You know, it really is. There's, there's, a, a, there's an authenticity, perhaps because of its roughness, perhaps because of its lack of the kind of sophistication that the big tourist companies have brought into the Sabi Sands and the Timbavati and into Botswana and places like that. I don't know. It always feels, I don't know whether people agree with me, but it always feels more like, more like, I don't want to say a genuine African experience because there's nothing not African about mm. going to Sabi Sabi or, you know, Thornybush or wherever. But th there is a, there's a, there's a pleasing roughness and rawness and immediacy mm. of holidaying in Zimbabwe. And I don't think that South Africans should be put off by the politics because as a tourist, you very seldom have to deal with it. Um, mm. The tourism companies, Garth, you'll know this, the tourism companies have learned how to handle the bureaucracy of getting in people in and out of the country smoothly. And once you're there, and once you're in one of the game reserves, hey, it's, a, it's as special a place as you can go in Africa. And I've been, you know, I've been to all but three African countries. So I think I can speak with some authority. And in the more touristy areas like... Um, 
Wangi and Victoria Falls, the politics that that doesn't really affect those places no. as much. And and as you said, like Wangi, you're a lot more. It's a lot more of an exclusive park experience. Like you can drive for hours and not see another soul. You're not queuing up yeah. to have a wildlife yeah. experience. I, mean, I, I, I remember. I remember three different lion sightings during the. I mean, I had. I don't know. I had less than 12 hours worth of time actually in Wangi Park. I had three different line experiences where we were the only, and I was alone in the vehicle, mm. and we were the only people watching and photographing mm. and looking at those lines. And, you know, that you don't get in Kruger, that you don't get at the luxury lodges in in the Savuti or mm. near the Lianti or anywhere like that. Yeah. No, and it's such yeah, a I'm big really park. Sorry, sorry. Dad, yeah, maybe, yeah. maybe you can speak into some of the... Uh, I was just going to say, you know, John... Sorry, Kim. Um, John, since you came with us, we've also uh, built a new lodge up in the north uh, called Nanchwich, north of Wang. Yeah. Um, and it's a full-day game drive going through the park, which I do every time, and, and, I, and we always do a family holiday at least once a year up there. And that day for me is phenomenal. And the last time we did it, we saw one other game drive vehicle. One mm. you know, a full mm. day, stopping at multiple different pans along the way, you you just feel like you you own the park. You know, it's just yeah. it's just it's you and place. and the wildlife. It's I, I I just I can't think of too many other places that one can experience that nowadays. Mm. And because of the tourism initiatives throughout the park, like other within the other lodges as well, there are so many water holes and so many pumps that you can drive for hours and still see animals because they they have access to water, which is obviously so important. Zimbabwe gets so dry and so hot as it's going into that season now for these for these pumps to be there. And John, when you initially went and, and you created a really lovely video for us, uh, for Elephant's Eye, you spoke about Wangi being a legacy reserve. Mm. Um, and I think the things that we're speaking into now explain why. Yeah, it, it is that. It's one of the great African reserves. And it's one of the great accessible African reserves. I mean, you 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 can you can get into Wangi and Kruger without being wealthy. You know, mm. to, to you can do fly camping safaris through the Serengeti and stuff, but still they're charging you in dollars. And even at the bottom end of the market into the Masai Mara or the Serengeti, it's it's not cheap. And then mm. the other great reserves like Salu are so far away and so difficult to get to that they also, there's a kind of built-in inaccessibility about them. But the great mm. thing about Kruger and um, Wangi for me is their accessibility to the common man, mm. to the person mm. who, you know, is, is a low-level manager or whatever the case may be or has his own plumbing business. You, you can go there and you can spend mm. a week there and really have this incredible game experience without being in debt to your bank manager for a mm. And I think also the, the location of Elephant's Eye being on the border of the park also makes it a lot more accessible for people who have maybe maybe done a self-drive or, mm -hmm. or things like that. Um, yeah, and now that, you know, after, after this pandemic, we all may be a little bit tighter in the pocket. So it, it, places like this still, still um, like you say, give accessibility to to a wider range of, of budget and people, which is wonderful. We can should I be able to experience our own Yes. Uh, yeah. I'm just wondering how, how you're coping. I mean, how, how are you keeping the business going? I've just spent three nights at, at Lekarvater, which is a natural selection place in the Huerp Reserve. They've got a concession there. And 90, 93% of their tourists are foreign, usually. And you, you can't charge South Africans what you charge foreigners, but you've built your lodge, you've built your business on an expectation of dollars and euros and pounds coming in. So they've had to cut their prices by 60% in order to get South Africans to, to afford the experience. Um, but there are a lot of South Africans, and now we can travel in, interprovincially. So people from Gauteng, KwaZulu Natal, and the Northern Cape can, can go there. But a place like Eye <coughs> in Zimbabwe, I don't think there are too many Zimbabweans well, who are well, doing kind of safari yeah. experiences at the moment. 
Well, John, funny enough, there, there, there are a fair bit. I mean, we, okay. we're starting to get them uh, to come. We actually we, we had our first clients this last weekend come and stay. Um, they came up from Bulawayo. Um, and we're getting quite a few more who are coming from Arari and the likes of Bulawayo. We've got a nice uh, – we booked out for three nights from a, a, a business you know, where, where all the staff are coming. It's obviously at a much lower cost. And, I mean, we're really doing it for – for our staff um, and yeah. just keeping the lodge going, you know, lodge sitting there. I mean, we've, the last guests we had was in March um, before wow. this. And wow. It, it, there's just nothing. I mean, our borders are closed. So the first thing, it's very similar to South Africa now that we're allowed to go on, on leisure travel. Um, you know, we, we're all getting out. Um, and the same with the Zimbabweans. Um, our next step will be once the borders open and then we'll get the South Africans coming. And funny enough, I've had a lot of friends contacting me who maybe in the past would go on a skiing trip or whatever and they don't want to do long trips and they now want to do the bush. Okay. I, mean, yeah. I mean, obviously, even for someone like myself, and I've been flying up for years now because there's such great connect. Sorry, this there was such great connectivity with the likes of Kenyan Airways. It was like flying to Joburg from Cape Town. Um, and now I can't. I'm like chomping at the bit. So like when the when the border opens, I'll I'll drive up. You know, <laughs> and I haven't so, driven up in, in 20 years. You know? mm. So if I may um, add in a bit about the Zimbabweans going to Wangi, and John, you were asking, you know, for local Zimbabweans. So being a Zimbabwean myself, who was living in Victoria Falls, it's now such a wonderful opportunity with the prices being a little bit lower and there are these amazing specials we have an amazing elephant's eye special an amazing wangi special at the moment and we are now able to to afford these experiences that used to be very much us dollar and only more yeah. internationally based so i guess the positive is that it's opened it up for us to experience such such beautiful places as well which the zimbabweans are very excited about mm. yeah and i mean i, I Sorry, John. Go ahead. No, off to you. No, I've, I've just noticed on online the Zimbabweans, a whole bunch of the group, which Kim, I'm sure you know from from Vic Falls, all cycled down to Wangi the other day. You know, yeah. I think people are are really appreciating what's a, what's around you. Yeah. Um, oh. I mean, I, when we were really in lockdown here in Cape Town, a friend of mine in Tucson, who's an, uh, uh, also sends us business in the industry, and he said, "Listen, God." When this lockdown's over in South Africa, you can take your kids to to Hermanus and they'll feel like it's um, the Seychelles. Yeah, you know? exactly. And, <laughs> and and I feel that's that's really what uh, what this lockdown has done to everyone around the world is, is to appreciate travel and to be able to get out there. Um, and uh, I, I, you know, the next time I'm having a a G and T on the on, on the Zambezia, I'll probably burst into tears. You know? <laughs> Well, Zimbabweans are so lucky. I'm bursting into tears at the thought of it. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> the, the backyard of people in Victoria Falls are things such as the Zambezi and are things such as Wangi National Park. Now I'm going to attempt to show you another video. <laughs> I hope I don't show you my screen again. Well, you've had practice. Um, you've been not messing yeah, up. You're, yeah, you're a pro I, now. I hope I get it right this time. But I'm going to show you a video about uh, Starbed at Elephant's Eye just to incite the the desire for travel a little bit more and for those zimbabweans who are watching and who are going to look into our zimbabwe wangi special the star bed actually i'll just show you because it it speaks completely for itself let me find it and now my computer is going to decide to freeze here okay here we go can you see yep there it is so this is the the eye this is our star bed and you sleep under the stars surrounded by wild animals why are they sleeping in the daytime <laughs> It's late afternoon. Oh, okay. <laughs> was wow, that, that there? fantastic. Was that there when you were there? No, no it wasn't. Okay. So, so John, I've um, I've uh, every time I go there, I, I sleep there with my my two sons. My wife still hasn't. Uh, she said no, we, we're crazy. She's going to stay at the lodge. Um, 
but the boys absolutely love it. Eh? And every time you guarantee elephants, every yeah. single night. Um, I haven't seen lion there, but the, the one night we had two male lions roaring like crazy uh, throughout the night, just kept it up. Um, it is, it, when, when, when you have that kind of, there's a, a lodge in the Timbavati I went to a few years ago, and they have something similar, doesn't look nearly as attractive as that, over a water hole. And we were woken at two o'clock in the morning with a lion and a hyena having a go at each other. Oh, wow. And then you start to believe that they that they can climb these ladders and get up to your platform. You and do I start think... to worry a little, and you do yeah. to look at the you do start to look at the um, the handheld radio that they've given yeah. you. Yeah. Work out how, how did they tell us to contact? Them? <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I think uh, that's the thrill. Of, of sleeping in, under in a star bed, open aired, you do very feel like you feel so much mm. a part of the, the the night and the night sounds of Africa. Uh, they resonate. It becomes almost like an orchestra where you really hear everything that's going on. So if there's a lion calling, even if he's just a little bit away, it it feels like it's it's so close and a bit very intimate. Um, so for those who want to sleep under the African Sky with what, potential what signs. Percentage of the, what percentage of the people who go to Elephant's Eye opt for the experience? Um, I don't know, that. You know versus you know versus people who say I'd really like to, but hey, a but bit a like, bit a bit a risky. Bit like <laughs> um, John, I'd say about twenty percent of the people sleep there. Um, so there's a fair bit who, who either may be nervous or they they're only coming for say three nights um, yeah. and they don't feel that they want to do the one night out of the deck but i think anyone who's really who's done a number of safaris and hasn't done that will, will jump at it and yeah i mean i i highly recommend it i, I was in the states last year at a, a doing one of these travel shows where you move from city to city and i met these two lovely american ladies who traveled together and i didn't realize they'd been to elephant's eye and they just came up to my table and started ranting and raving about what an amazing experience that the the, oh. the I was sleeping out that night. That was the highlight of the African trip, and and I really do think that that I yeah you know, I couldn't recommend it anymore to to, to anyone. They should. Can I ask? Also, I'm not, uh, sorry, John. I'm, I'm obviously not that convincing because I haven't managed to get my wife to sleep there yeah. yet. Well, yeah. you managed to convince her to marry you, so you must be quite. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what what's what have you heard about what's happening with with wildlife in Wangi and in that in that buffer corridor outside uh, in terms of extra poaching because you'll have a lot of people who are not getting the money that they would have got with an active tourist industry and I know that that you guys take the idea of supporting local communities letting them benefit from your conservation activity your conservation tourist activity I know that yeah, you take so that very very seriously so how's What's happening with that? Well, John, obviously I was very concerned in the beginning um, of this whole uh, uh, pandemic or whatever we want to call it <laughs> that's really affected all of us this year on the poaching side because, you know, now tourists aren't coming, you know, people aren't, uh, don't have jobs. It's, it's obviously really affecting Zim, you know, along with all the other uh, political issues. Um, but what... Fortunately for us, as we, uh, we a number of years ago, we set up the uh, CWF, um, Conservation Wildlife Fund, um, because even in, so in the forestry area we in, we've got forestry uh, patrols from the forestry guys and in, in the parks, and they've also got um, um, parks rangers patrolling. Yeah. But they are, you know, they're underfunded um, and needed support. So that's why, why we created this initiative and, and and basically, we, we have our own um, ranges out there, and we work together with the with both forestry and parks, um, with the local communities, um, and and patrol actually with the forestry guards as well. Uh, and that's a, that's really helped on the poaching side. Um, we do uh, air surveillance, um, and we've got vehicles and, and management on the ground and that. So that is something that we didn't have in place uh, back uh, when you were there. Um, and so that's helped a lot. Uh, obviously, the you know the, the bigger area, which the, the area that we have to watch out for on the poaching is the buffer zone because we are closest to to the community communal areas and that. Um, but uh, you know, it's 
it's not as, as bad, you know, it's not, like, it's funny, I, I, I'll get people who've never been to Wangi and they presume because of um, the political issues that the, the poaching is, is rife. And yes, of course, there's poaching for sure. Um, but actually, we are quite effective between um, forestry parks, the police and um, the CWF in yeah. Um, yeah. keeping the, the, the poaching numbers down. Because I, I was there fairly soon after that terrible poisoning incident where, you know, that, that water hole was poisoned and so many elephants died. And it, it, again, people look at that and say, oh, the, the end of the world is coming. But there was a very quick and stern reaction to that. People were arrested. And yes, there, there have been elephants that have lost their lives subsequently, but nothing, anything approaching that scale since. And that's, you know, six, seven years ago which is an indication that these are not regularly occurring and more frequently occurring incidents, I think. So the organizations such as CWF and the anti-poaching unit um, that that works with forestry in the concession, as well as in Greater Wangi, which is linked to a bunch of other lodges, it's an amazing initiative that tourism has come together with that pr provides these anti-poaching, it's incredible the work they do and the snares that they pick up. And I think with that human presence, poachers are, are, are more reticent to come into yeah. the park, um, which is also why we're very keen to, to get people back in because game drive vehicles and such things with that human presence keeps, keeps poaching down. Mm. Um, there, there, is, there are other initiatives that we have in the park, sorry, with Elephant's Eye, um, so we've got the conservation side, and then we also have an amazing community um, program called Grow Africa, under which a project called Project Receiver falls under. And we're actually going to invite de Villiers de Graaf from De Grendel. I hope I said it right. <laughs> I don't always get it right with my Zimbabwean accent. So de Villiers is going to join us now to chat about some community initiatives that we, we do at Elephant's Eye as well. I think, there we go. Hi, <laughs> Hi Davilius, welcome. How are you? Thank you for joining us this evening. Well, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be yeah. here. So lovely. Are those, so are, those, are those real books or is that a kind of Zoom background behind you? <laughs> <laughs> it's my secret. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm not as well read as you. I'm so scared you're going to ask me see one of the labels and ask me some questions that I won't be able to answer. <laughs> <laughs> it's off, it's off it's to the questions. I'm just I'll, I'll, I'll keep it to wine and and education here. So <laughs> de Villiers, I was I was just saying that um at Elephant's Eye we have some amazing community initiatives and De Grendel who provides the wine for Elephant's Eye, which is delicious and we'll get to that in a moment. But you guys um you support one of our projects called Project Revival, which is a scholarship project for the kids at Dungani Primary School in Dete Village. And you have very kindly sponsored 20 children um, to go to school this year, which is amazing. And as we know, those, those don't just affect the kids, it affects the families and the village and the community as a whole financially as well as sponsoring the ECD teacher, which is the early childhood development teacher. Can you explain your furthering education legacy within De Grendel and how you came to be with Hideaways? Yeah, well, um, thanks to, to Garth's initiative and um, our, you know, supplying the wine, um, this initiative really just resonated with, with me and with De Grendel uh, because of our own um, focus on on, edu on educational product uh, projects back in you know back back in South Africa, um, and it's kind of a, a, a something that's been instilled upon me um, throughout my life. I think it's been passed on one generation to the next, and it really started uh, as far as a legacy is concerned with my great grandfather, uh, who uh, founded and bought the Crendel uh, back in um, 1890. Um, he came from the little town of Valiesdorp, um, a rural town in the Western Cape, um, where in the 1870s there were no there were no schools. And as a as a young 12 year old, he was sent to Cape Town to get a to get an education, um, and attended night school where he learned to read and write, and then worked for an uncle in 
uh, in a in a butchery business, and um, and I think he he realized the importance of of that opportunity. And um, so when he made good in business um, in meat in the meat and refrigerate cold store refrigeration uh, business, um, he um, plowed back. Um, a donation to uh, what, what effectively now is known as the De Villiers-Schroff High School in Villiersdorp, mm. um, and which is still going to this day. So we have still, have a, as a family, have a very close connection with, with the school, um, and um, and also with our own farming um, operations in the Western Cape. You know, this is something that we really um, contribute or fo focus on, um, and and looking in looking after our. Uh, farm workers, uh, children, um, providing you know uh, educational opportunities, supporting with ed with education, transport, and um, you know funds and computer facilities on the farm and, and the internet and aftercare facilities. Um, so this this um, project of Garth's uh, with Grow Africa, um, as I mentioned, is uh, something that 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 is is a you know something that we really feel strongly about. So it, it was. Just a, fantastic to be able to participate in something um, you know a bit further away, um, yeah. and we're and we're, we're operational our brand and to grow our brand and, and it's a kind of a I think part of our brand um, our, you know part of our brand story and adds to that whole authenticity of a brand um, and yeah. being able to tell stories and all the, you know that whole thing about. And Sorry, this is the importance of, of these kind of um, initiatives when you have your, your, your wine farm and, and we have uh, our lodge to be able to have a partnership, to create partnerships with the same values of helping beyond the lodge and beyond the wine farm to those people who it affects um, in the communities around national parks and around your farm. And I just wanted to just let you know that I actually went to the school last year just before... Um, I came here in February, I went to the school, I think in November, and I met the ECD teacher and I met the kids who had received the scholarships and things. And just the joy and the gratitude of, of being able to continue making progress in, as, as a small community, that there, there was this help. Um, and with tourism being at a pause, these are the type of initiatives that suffer a little bit because... Um, people aren't there to see or, or, or donate. And, and just to let people know who are watching, if, if you would like to be part of the scholarship program, if you would like to donate, um, I, think it, I think it costs less than 30 US dollars for a child to go to, to school for a term. So for those who, who aren't able to travel at the moment but would still like to, to further education and be part of these initiatives, um, please drop us an email. But maybe, Garth, you want to talk a little bit about wine and De wine? I think you have some there with you, no? I do, yes. <laughs> and, I, and I see uh, De Villiers has got, a, the, got the expensive bottle behind him. <laughs> yeah. But I actually came out really <laughs> um, Kim, I actually wanted to just okay. you know, uh, thank. Uh, uh, that I'm <laughs> I'm not left out. You've obviously got yeah. a very good taste, all of you. This is the the, the Chardonnay, which is one of my favourite local Chardonnays. I'll come get thank some you. this weekend, De Villiers. Yeah, I'm a Merlot man, so I, yeah, that's what I've got here. So, Sorry, but, Garth, you wanted to thank. Yeah, I, I wanted to thank De Villiers for for helping out at Dingani School. You know, it's um, we, we also support the the Kenilworth Primary School here as well. Um, our offices are on 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 Claremont, and I remember going there once with one of our staff, and she was about to go ding, to Dingani School, and she she was quite sort of taken aback by the the the. the uh, the school here because she said oh their facilities you know aren't aren't that great blah 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 and i said to her well, i said just wait till you go to dingani school then you're going to have a real eye opener and um because dingani school at that stage which we had just taken on had the old asbestos roofs with holes in it every third uh window pane was broken um i mean remember the first time i went there i asked to see their library and it was like a room maybe half the size of a single garage and, I, and, I, and I'm not exaggerating when I say that the books were, were just old paper. 
I actually thought they were joking with, you know, that it was a joke. And so and they had no electricity um, and uh, running water. They had one well at that stage. And, you know, we, we've gradually um, um, been supporting them. And, I mean, the school is, is a different place today. They've got, they've got electricity. They've got running water now. Um, all the, the, the all the roofs are, are repaired. Um, we've managed to get more teachers in to support them. The, the pass rate has gone up. But what, what I do find amazing for, in those communities, I mean, they're, they're, it's real poverty. And they don't see, those kids aren't ever going to come and see uh, uh, Elephant's Eye naturally. We actually do have a program where we bring them uh, to Elephant's Eye. We do game drives with them. And but normally they, they wouldn't see any of that kind of wealth. In their lives, and I mean, they they come. In. No, I was also just um, the, the parents are also very involved in the school and provide hours of their work, you know, of their time uh, every week for free. Um, and you know, I think it's pretty interesting how how much importance parents um, and families attach to education. Um, you know, in in Zimbabwe, um, it's you know something that's that Zimbabwe is so well known for is the education um, yeah. that has yeah, well, reaped the benefit over the years as well. Um, yeah, totally, I, Davilius, I mean, that's what that's what I've picked up is that the commitment from the parents, and they might live in, in mud huts and only have a few goats and, and a bit of cattle, but they really want to get their kids educated. And I think the importance of your scholarships and this Rezibo Fund, um, I just want to share a picture with you quickly of some of the kids who did receive your your scholarships and you can just see the smiles on their faces of how how proud they are to have received them and be a part of of such initiative um but also if you if you have these some funding going towards scholarships there's there's leftover funding to be channeled into other parts of the school like the library and like the roof and and things like that so thank you so much to Vivian. um we are starting to run out of time so we do need to wrap Can up I, so would you, would you mind if i said something very quickly about absolutely this? yes uh, because course. i mean I've, I've i've traveled a lot and i've been to a lot of places a lot of conservation places i i have big passions for primates and for birds and so i've gone to a lot of places where you can see different primates and birds and everywhere you go people profess to be community-minded but my experience is that probably 50% of that is a corporate, a CSI box tick. And they do the minimum to keep whatever audit happens of their CSI projects to keep those auditors happy. But my sense from what I'm seeing and hearing here is that this is one of the better half that take it seriously. It's not a box ticking exercise. It's not we need to give some money somewhere to some educational product, otherwise people will point fingers at us for being uncaring. This is about actually caring. This is about really wanting to make a difference. And because you really want to make a difference and you put some muscle and some money behind it, you are making a difference. Mm. And it's and it's so true, John. And I think part of the Zimbabwean ethos is a very caring ethos and everybody looks after um, each other in communities from, from the lodges to to the anti-poaching units, to the schools. Um, everybody's so proud to be Zimbabwean and, and everything that comes from that is, 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 a caring, is a caring way. So thank you, Davilius, for making that possible as well. And I think, um, thank you. I think yeah, it's, it's been lovely to have you on the chat. And um, just quickly, one last thing uh, for John. So through your, through your radio show, you often talk about how it's possible to build a pos positive scenario rather than a negative one. And you've spoken into the passion and resourcefulness of African people. So what will, words will you share with us today to, to continue holding on to hope as, as we go forward? <laughs> I, I have a, no, I have, I have a story that I tell because I was, a, I, I was a foreign correspondent for many years and traveled to wherever people were dying in large numbers in Africa through mostly through civil war, sometimes through famine, sometimes through flood, sometimes through all three. And I was constantly struck by just how brutal we can be to each other, how you know, 
politics and competition for resources can lead to extraordinary inhumanity. But everywhere I went in all of those countries, I was met by individual Africans, just people who lived in villages and small towns on the edges of towns who refused to abandon a sense that there could be a better future for themselves and for their countries. And perhaps the most graphic example of that was um, flying into Huambo, a city in the, um, the town in the Angolan highlands. And there'd been a huge battle between UNITA and the MPLA. And Huambo had essentially been flattened. There was, we spent three days there and I didn't see a single building that had 100% structural integrity. Everything was broken and damaged. And we arrived in a World Food Program, um, Hercules C-130, and we landed and taxied to where there were a lot of people. And there was a gentle rain falling. And a woman, they call them Los Mutilados, the, the mutilated ones, the landmine victims. And she broke through the security court. And she had one whole limb. Her left leg was the only full limb that she had. The right leg was blown off and cut off above the knee. The right arm was the right arm was cut off below the elbow and the left arm there and she had a crutch and she was hopping on her one leg holding herself up on this homemade crutch and she was shouting at us in the local language and we said to the interpreter what is she saying and they translated as she is saying it is raining we must plant did you bring seed uh, so can, yeah. can you imagine a life yeah more wretched than the life that she lived and she wanted to plant so something would grow That's so that amazing. that for me is the story which sums up the spirit that i have seen and continue to see throughout this wonderful continent of ours that's amazing and i think you know we feel like it's been storming and it's been raining for the last few months and we should plant some seeds <laughs> we should plant some we should plan something. <laughs> which is, you know, which is what, what you're doing, what you're yeah. doing with these projects. These are planting seeds for the future. These are planting educational seeds, yeah. some of which will grow into big trees of knowledge and big trees of corporate success and, you know, metallurgists and geologists and teachers. These are the seeds that you're planting with these projects that you're busy with. Oh, it's going to make me a little bit emotional. <laughs> Um, on that very beautiful note, um, thank you all three of you for joining this evening, Garth, for another Beyond the Lodge. Guys, it's been wonderful to chat to you both. Um, and we thank you for inviting me. Have a beautiful evening. Thank you. And, uh, sorry, I just wanted to thank, thank you, John. Thanks very much, uh, De Villiers, and thanks, Kim. And I just wanted to uh, do a shout out to everyone. Our next, this was our fourth uh, Beyond the Lodge. Our next one is going to be on the what I call the Golden Safari Circuit, which is Vic Falls, Wangi, and Chobi. Um, and we'll also be launching a, 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 a competition um, for two. Uh, and we'll be staying at, at all of our fantastic lodges um, around Zimbabwe and Botswana. So please do uh, like us on Facebook and follow us. And the next couple of weeks, um, you'll hear about the competition and our next live. So thanks yeah. very much. Thanks a lot. Very exciting. Okay. Bye. 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 Bye.